cloud. All right, cool. Um, welcome everyone uh, to this month's Fireside Chat, hosted by the Turing Way. Um, my name is Anne Lee Steele. I'm the community manager uh, for the project, and we'll be bringing perspectives and questions and learnings from our community to this conversation. Um, with this being said, I'm really, really excited uh, for this month's topic, uh, as it brings some really important and urgent and topical questions related to really the foundations of, of science and research itself. Um, a few words about the Turing Way as a project, the obligatory plug. Um, it is an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook on data science. Um, our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collab collaborative data science possible uh, and to make it both accessible and comprehensible for everyone. Um, and while it's me speaking um, with you all today, I'm part of a much wider team and represent a much larger international community of researchers who've created uh, this resource. Um, and they themselves bring perspectives from their countries, their backgrounds, their contexts. And so this fireside chat series uh, is an effort towards creating a kind of shared space within the open ecosystem where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, um, share different practices that work in their context to build allyship and to understand each other's work and perspectives just a little bit better. Um, I'm really delighted to co-host this conversation today with Georgia Aikenhead of Box Spaces um, and my colleague at the Alan Turing Institute, um, who will introduce herself in a moment. And when Georgia and I began talking about you know, planning this event together on citizen and participatory science, as someone who had first heard of citizen science as a means of harnessing the possibility of crowdsourcing and data collection at scale, um, that simply wasn't possible before the technological advances we've had today. I was really struck actually by the questions, the foundational questions that citizen and participatory science has increasingly asked of the scientific process itself and the structural challenges that it poses to the status quo. Um, who is usually involved in the scientific process it asks in research, who is talked about or with uh, talked about or to, but perhaps not worked with, um, who is an amateur scientist, who is a citizen, um, and how has technology really changed the landscape of all of these questions? Um, but I won't talk too much about that. I'll leave it to Georgia to properly introduce today's topic. Um, <coughs> but I will say a few um, housekeeping things before we get started. Um, just note that we have a shared etherpad that we'll uh, drop the link in, and we have been um, towards the beginning here to facilitate written note taking and invite ideas from you all um, who joined us this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you may be calling in from. Um, feel free to ask questions and, and notes to the pad or to the chat, and we'll look out for them throughout the call. Um, I also want to flag here that we have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. Um, if you have any concerns or would like to report an incident, something that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call, um, or have other ideas on how we can improve our accessibility as a community, please email the Turing Way at gmail.com. You can also reach out to me or to Malvika Sharon, who is the co-lead of the Turing Way, um, by emailing us at our respective addresses, which is provided in the Etherpad. Um, also, just another last reminder is that we will be keeping this Zoom room open after this recorded part of the session for an additional 30 minutes. Um, and it's completely optional, uh, but it's where we are able to turn off the recording uh, to ask questions of each other and and of ourselves in a perhaps less formal space uh, than the one that we've created here. Um, a kind of fireside for the fireside. Uh, but with that, I will turn off the sound of the fire behind me and pass it on to Georgia uh, to introduce the topic today, who then pass it on to our speakers. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. And thank you, Anne, as well. I'm really excited to be here with such fabulous speakers. Um, my name is Georgia Aikenhead. I'm a member of the Alan Turing Institute, and I've been working with a community of neurodiverse collaborators, open source developers, and researchers on art spaces. So to give you a very brief overview, art spaces is an open source participatory project to build a citizen science platform, which will be used to investigate how autistic people process sensory information and how this affects them in their daily lives. Um, so to give you a little bit of an example, autistic people might find lights brighter, sounds louder, or busy spaces more overwhelming compared to non-autistic people. And this can mean that lots of places which many of us take for granted, um, like hospitals, workplaces, and public transport, 
are uncomfortable or even completely inaccessible for many autistic people. So we want to gather qualitative data um, using citizen science to learn how to make changes to improve our community environments for autistic people. Um, so Art Spaces is a community project and relies completely on a diverse collection of collaborators. And there are too many to name in person, uh, but thanks especially to Susanna Fantoni, Sue Iwai Otis-Smith, Tom Auger, Catherine Manning, um, Robin Taylor, who I can see you joined us in the audience. Hi, Robin. Uh, Robin's done some amazing, um, hello, amazing development on a voluntary basis. That's been incredibly helpful. And also thank you to Kirsty Whitaker, the Turing Way and All Spaces are both the brain children of Kirsty. So uh, she's amazing. Um, the Turing Way and All Spaces are also deeply connected in terms of their shared values of community, collaboration, open science, and a commitment to more equitable and diverse research. So when Anne suggested we host a fireside chat together uh, to discuss citizen science and explore it, I jumped at the chance. Um, Citizen science is very related to participatory science, and there's a whole lot of terms that are used often interchangeably, sometimes with um, a lot of distinction, um, and they tend to be overlapping or diverge depending on the context, the field, and all kinds of things. So it's quite hard to delineate a particular realm for citizen science versus related things like community, um, community-based research, participatory. <coughs> research and a whole set of other terms that are often used. But what I can say is that citizen science and participatory science are today at a point of critical importance. In recent years, there's been a huge rise in awareness, proliferation and diversification of citizen and participatory approaches, but is still often on the periphery of mainstream science with the level of integration and acceptance differing across fields, regions and institutions. Citizen and participatory science remains in a space of risk, challenge, and even paradox. But what it offers is the possibility of changes which are profound and fundamental to research. Changes to how we conduct, conceptualize, and communicate research. Who it is for, who it is done by, and how it interacts with society. So it's in a spirit of curiosity, solidarity, and excitement that I welcome our guests today, all of whom are doing really impressive, impactful work in the field of citizen science today. So it's a real privilege to be joined today by James Scott, who has been a long-term participatory contributor to art spaces, as well as strategic leader within art spaces. And Bastian Grzeka Zvoras, who in addition to being a researcher for the incredibly inspiring Transbiome project, which you'll be talking about today, is soon to be joining the Turing on the 1st of November um, as a citizen science expert and PI on art spaces. It's also an immense honor to welcome Mark Kushner, who is an astrophysicist and the citizen science officer for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, fostering an incredible portfolio of citizen science projects. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about them today and discussing them further, as well as Pen Yuan Ting, who has been doing amazing work promoting and building citizen science and open source, including by his own citizen science project, Mammal Web. Um, so many cool things that people have been doing. Um, and it's been a pleasure to meet all of these speakers and discuss citizen science with you all. And I've already gained a huge amount of insight and food for thought. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Um, so we wanted to create a space today to talk across our projects, share questions, challenges, and trade-offs that come with this building of community um, and citizen science as an enterprise which is both challenging and incredibly fruitful in terms of the possibilities um, that it can provide. So um, we want to ask, we, that we encourage you to share your experiences with us today as well. So all of you audience members, if you want to ask questions, we will be um, continuing to have a discussion following this session for the half hour from 5 to 5.30 um, in UK time. And we'll begin with a short round of introductions of around two minutes each to kick us off. Um, so we will start with Bastian, who will introduce him first, followed by James, Penn, and then Mark. Um, so if you would like to begin, Bastian. Yeah, sure. You already gave a very brief introduction of myself. So indeed, I'm, I'm joining the Turing in 
like three days, <laughs> but my last few days in Paris, where I'm currently based, because until recently I was a researcher at INSERM, the French NIH equivalent and University of Paris in the Center for Research and Interdisciplinarity, where I ran the peer-produced research lab, where we were really were interested in making citizen science that's coming from communities and individuals rather than citizen science coming from the aspect that's driven by academics that invite the participation of the general public, but research that started from individuals or communities. And one example, Georgia briefly mentioned is the, the transbiome study, which started from one, one of our students. She was a master student who was interested because she's a transgender woman in understanding the transgender uh, the neovaginal microbiome of transgender women, which is something that no gynecologist or academic researcher had really studied, which means that trans women cannot get gynecological health care needs, needs met, because when they go to the gynecologist, they might say, oh, but you are, first of all, not, quote unquote, a real woman, so what are you doing here? And if you can convince a gynecologist or find one that's sympathetic to even do any testing, if you have an infection of your neo-vagina as a trans woman, they test for the in typical infectants of cis women. And the results come back negative and say, good news, you don't have an infection. And like she said, well, but I actually know that I currently have an infection. I can see the smell and how it looks like. Like, trust me, there is an infection, but no one can help me because the basic research is not there. And so she approached me and said, well, would you be interested in helping me do a citizen science project on, on this topic where we basically try to find trans women from across Europe to self-sample their microbiome and we can sequence it and look at it. And I said, oh, this would be amazing. Not only is my current research on citizen science started from communities or individuals <laughs> like you, but by training, I'm actually a biologist and a bioinformatician that's done a lot of microbiome work, which she didn't even know about. So it was like, oh man, you did come to the exact right person to actually talk about this, which was really fun. So, and these are just one example of projects we've been doing. So the Odd Spaces project will be another one that's really coming from community needs. We've worked on COVID related projects because we work with a community of patients from very different backgrounds, but all having a higher risk of like, if they get COVID, we have a very serious case. So they were interested, how can we track our data and see the symptoms over time? and co-developed an open source tool quite similar to what Georgia described for OddSpaces. We made an open source platform for people to use wearable data as, way, as well as daily symptom reports of where they say, do you have an infection right now? Do you feel it weird in any way? And people have been using this and actually contributed to writing the code for it. So just based on patients' needs. We've worked with the uh, community around type 1 diabetes where people hacked their own artificial open pancreas. So they made open source hardware and software to automatically pump insulin based on continuous glucose monitoring data. So these are the types of communities I'm really interested in and that fit into my background. And I think that's, I will leave it there. <laughs> um, thanks, um, thanks, Bastian. And um, hi, everyone. I'm James Scott. Um, it's a real honor to be um, on this uh, panel today. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a volunteer on the Alt Spaces uh, project um, at the Anna Turing Institute. Um, in my day job, I work as a senior policy advisor at the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation in the UK government, which is a small, a small uh, directorate within uh, the Department of Culture, Digital Culture, Media and Sport that's responsible for supporting ethical innovation um, across the, the um, digital sector, tech sector, um, working both on projects inside and outside of government. And I've kind of worked a number of really cool projects at the moment, for example, on the um, on, on the ethical collection of um, demographic data for bias analysis, which is a really interesting project, which I think might have some intersections potentially uh, with citizen science. Um, I started in the civil service as a classic policy generalist some years ago um, in DWP comms uh, with a politics degree um, and have worked on a range of roles um, in the kind of in classic policy jobs, but also in the Pavement Insights team at HMRC, which very much opened my mind to the kind of research uh, method and the scientific approach, which is not something you always you always have in government, um, and also in some ops roles as well, which were really, really challenging. Um, I I'm also dyspraxic, um, and that does impact on my coordination, my, sit, my verbal and, and written sequencing, some organization time management skills. And this has affected me um, in my work on occasions. 
and I've become very acutely aware of, of sort of um, the, uh, the challenges facing a lot of people who are, who are neurodivergent in the workplace. Um, so it's kind of in that vein that I kind of was attracted to your spaces project um, as a really, really interesting and potentially really impactful project um, that could potentially open up a massive amount of um of data and, and have a really huge impact on the way in which government can conceptualize and 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 kind of deal with research and deal with data um i was thinking particularly in relation to kind of when i was um working at, in department of transport and thinking about actually the case for disability and the cost benefit analysis is around making train stations more accessible and actually you know the data wasn't necessarily there at this point in time and it's quite difficult without that raw data to be able to kind of take these judgments particularly on kind of more qualitative questions so you know the potential impacts are massive um and i think actually you know including and it's the same for policy making as well including um including the um a diverse community of people when you're developing government policy um is incredibly important but it's not always something that's done or done effectively so actually it's something that's really, this project really kind of stood out to me and I've been kind of involved since pretty much the beginning um, or doing various things. And yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm really passionate about it and um, really kind of keen for it to develop to fruition. Um, I'm also co-chair of DC Disability Network, um, which again is a, is a really um, interesting, interesting um, role and one in which, um, you know, I think it dem has demonstrated to me the importance of collecting good quality data and ensuring that people are empowered in um, solutions and in relation to um, policies, et cetera. So once again, it demonstrates um, how important that is to me as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a bit about me, why I'm interested involved in the project. And um, yeah, I'm very much will be in the vein as somebody who's not running a citizen science project at the moment, um, coming from slightly the other side of somebody who's involved uh, for, as, a, as a member and participant. Ah, thank you. Shall we move on to Pen Yuan? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Pen Yuan Xing, but you can just call me Pen. Uh, my preferred English pronouns are he and they. Um, I am really, really honored to be here with you today. I, uh, I have done a lot of, you know, kind of random things throughout my life. Uh, they both taught me a lot, and I am humbled by the opportunity to maybe share some of those experiences with you. So my original um, background and training is in ecology and conservation, where I started with doing a lot of field work around the world, from places like Costa Rica to South Africa or Papua New Guinea. And it was a very humbling um, experience to be a, begin with because, you know, by doing science, you're really discovering the depth of your own ignorance. Uh, right. But I had no idea about how much more humbling it was going to become because later uh, I was very lucky to be one of the co-founders of the Web Citizen Science Project, which I started uh, in the UK uh, several years ago, um, where I worked with a lot of community members throughout England and a group from there where I worked with them to use motion sensing camera traps to monitor local wildlife. And uh, since we've started in 2014, there are now more than 350 British citizen scientists, not only in the UK, but across several countries in Europe, who are using these camera traps co to collect wildlife pictures that are uploaded to our web platform where it is collaboratively classified by more than 2,000 citizen scientists from across the world. Now, I was really naive to begin with when I thought, you know, oh, I'm just one ecologist, so it'd be nice to crowdsource the data collection and classification to a bunch of people who are going to do it for me. But my, my views on citizen science have really been challenged and my preconceived notions have been changed throughout the years where I had the privilege of getting to know some people who I thought were citizen scientists working for me, but they went on to start their own wildlife monitoring projects to answer their own ecological questions 
completely independent from us that I didn't even conceive of before. And it was through connections like these that I got to know a lot of incredible citizen science projects that are done uh, by other people across the world. And it really uh, made me think about what does it really mean to do citizen science, right? So, you know, I often hear about people saying things like, you know, oh, I am a researcher and I got a lot of, you know, citizens to do research for me. But my question is, you know, so are you not a citizen um, of this world? And what are some of the distinctions that we're making here and why are we doing that? Well, so these are some of the things that I really like to think about. And what does it really mean to do science, right? And I think science is a fundamentally iterative process where we're building on what came before and uh, uh, using, you know, parts of the scientific method as our tools to look at the world and answer questions. So if we're doing that, then we're doing science. So what's the distinction then between, you know, a scientist versus a citizen scientist? You know, these are things that I love to think about. And also during this time, I was really lucky to get into the open source and open science communities. So I've been lucky to become part of the elected leadership of organizations such as the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, which is happening uh, right now, uh, it's first in-person meeting in a long time. And I am also extremely privileged to act in kind of an advisory role to organizations such as NASA or UNESCO and implementing open science policies as well. So I've been super lucky and I'm really privileged and honored to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Should we go over to you, Mark? Splendid. Thanks, Georgia. And thanks, Penn and Bastian and James. Uh, it's really interesting hearing about your background and the the, the clever projects that, that you, you, you cooked up. Um, I'm the citizen science officer for NASA, which means I have the extremely pleasant job of helping foster citizen science around the agency. Most of it is in a, in a division, the uh, science mission directorate. Um, we have a website I'm going to put in the chat that has a uh, has all of our projects. We're up to 30 now because we just launched a new one this week. It's called Spectacular. It's a project where uh, if you're handy with a camera and you like chasing storms, you go out and take pictures of thunderclouds, in particular looking at the action above the thundercloud uh, because there are all kinds of poorly understood electrical and atmospheric phenomena that happen above thunderclouds. And that's what this project is asking people to get involved in. So that's spectacular.org. Come try it out. Um, so, but anyway, about me, I am, I started out as an astrophysicist. It was really fun doing my own science, um, spending a lot of time self promoting, as you know, academics do. And I got, um, Kind of frustrated by that by that scene to some degree, as many academics do as well. Uh, and when I learned about science about citizen science, I started my own citizen science project. Uh, 2014 I launched Disk Detective, and I've been addicted ever since. And if you don't press the stop button, I'll keep talking. So I'll pass the mic. Thanks so much for having me here. Thanks so much for joining us. Wow, really amazing things everyone's doing. I feel quite starstruck. Um, so I was wondering, as someone who is also working in citizen science, trying to sustain a community of neurodiverse people, what do you all think it takes to sustain a citizen science community? Um, and I'm curious about your response, James, particularly as someone who is a participant. Um, so what do you all think it takes to sustain over time and grow a citizen science community? Thanks, thanks, Georgia. Um, so I think from the perspective of somebody outside, and I think also within the context of the Alt Spaces project as well, which is, um, I think, very involved because community members are involved in the development of the platform, the policy underpinning the platform, and, and obviously um, ensuring um, in, in, at every stage of the process. But I think obviously the really important thing is to ensure that the opportunities to get involved are genuine there is a very, very different um, 
different thing between somebody being involved in a project, um, you know, providing data, but actually not having deep level involvement in terms of um, actually setting policy and direction. Um, and I think being really clear about what the opportunities are as well, it's really important not to overpromise and under, de under deliver, and that will lead to a community, you know, flaming out very, very quickly. Um, I think also, and I think it's really important that we, you know, that's thought about very deeply at the conception stage of the project. Um, I think it's also really, really important that the diverse needs of the community are taken into account um, uh, when you're um, identifying and, and, and engaging with participants. I mean, firstly, um, for all spaces, it's very, very important, obviously, but you're not just getting a subset of the autistic community. Um, you need to get a diverse community, uh, a diverse community involvement. So that means going out kind of um, and reaching out to people across the country, not just focusing on, say, for example, in London, um, and reaching out to people beyond kind of uh, people who are usually involved in kind of um, academic research or um, in, in advocacy um, in autism. And I think that's really, really important to ensure that there is a diverse community on board. Um, I think also considering the different needs of, of members, I mean, that could include a time. Some people have a lot more time available to them than others. Um, it could be also um, it could also be technical understanding and, and knowledge as well. Some people are much more confident, obviously, in utilising uh, IT than others. And I think for all spaces, one of the big challenges that we had was GitHub, which is obviously uh, something that not everyone's conversant in, um, and therefore it needs to be really kind of carefully thought about in terms of one onboarding to GitHub. And sometimes actually some of the contractors working on the project struggled with doing that, let alone the, let alone the volunteers. But also. I'm thinking about alternative measure uh, ways to engage as well. I think another takeaway for me and would be also ensuring that engagement is really suited to the needs and experiences, the interests of, of community members. It's not about kind of aimless, everybody sort of, you know, every get kind of doing everything. Um, obviously, you would want engagement to be meaningful and you need it to be um, kind of really focused in on, on what the project needs, but also what the uh, individual members need. I think underpinning all of this engagement from my perspective, is the, the need for people running at multiple speeds and for there to be a really clear version of truth um, in terms of, um, so for example, you know, I have a busy job, so I perhaps can't log in or, or go to every meeting. So therefore there needs to be, and other people might want to be involved all the time and just doing everything. I think what, the, what needs to kind of underpin that project is a really clear version of truth so people can very, very easily um, see um, what's going on where the project's moved to um, and um, you know who is responsibility for what. I think the danger if you don't have that is that the project will move along and people will lose heart or get a bit downcast, not be quite sure what's going on. And I, I suspect that's quite a big reason why people dip out. Um, and certainly there was a time, you know, there was a time I was struggling to find the time and I lost confidence. I was a bit like, oh, you know, I don't know what's going on. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm laying people down. I think having that really clear, really clear version of the truth, you know, ideally just set out one, two pages, this is what's going on, this is where we are, um, and make it really clear as well that people don't need to go to every meeting, they need to be deeply involved all the time, they can jump in and off, on and off. Um, I think that's really important. It's important for documentation, but I think it's also important for, important to remove the frictions for people um, wanting to get involved in these type of citizen science projects, which are very involved. Um, so those are a few of my, a few of my takeaways. I, I'm, I'm sure there's a huge amount more to talk about, but um, yeah, I will see the floor to, to others. Shall we move on to Ken? All right. Um, yeah, thank you, James, for, for all of that. I think you covered you know, all the bases. Um, I, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I can think of a lot of uh, responses to that, but maybe I will just um, give one really small example uh, uh, maybe of um, of me experiencing the privilege that I have um, as someone uh, as an academic in a university versus a lot of the participants that I collaborated with um, on our project, right? In terms of uh, how to sustain the community. So uh, when we started our web platform, you know, obviously we have a lot of wildlife pictures uh, on our website that we ask people to help us classify. And those are really high resolution images. And 
when I'm you know testing the website uh, from a university computer, everything loads instantly. But uh, a lot of our participants, they might be you know connecting to the website from their homes in a really rural area uh, with a really slow internet connection, and they're like, oh, it takes like two minutes uh, for me to load one image uh, on my computer to help classify. And it uses up a huge amount of the data out of the very limited bandwidth that I get every month and stuff like this. So um, I encountered a lot of these examples when I started and tried to organize this as a science project. And I think the point is to just be really mindful um, of privilege in relationships like this and, and, and really like interact with and, and, and think of uh, the people you work with, not as participants, but as collaborators, and really uh, 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 plan how you want to organize your community before you even start the project. Um, so I'll just use this one quick example rather than me trying to respond to everything, uh, if that's okay. But well, hopefully it'll spark, you know, spark more conversations. I'd be really curious um, how you think through this, Mark, as well, um, operating on the massive scales that you are um, with NASA citizen science projects. Um, have you seen a difference in how those communities are, how you're able to sustain those, those projects over long periods of time? I mean, I think James and Penn really hit on, you know, fundamental stuff. You have to be courteous. You have to be just like decent to your, to the people who are contributing their time. Um, and that is already a, a, there's a lot to think about there, right? With people in different time zones, people with different socioeconomic status, people different, everybody, right? Um, so, you know, one thing I would add that I didn't hear is that um, when we've asked citizen scientists who are participating in NASA projects, we asked them why they do it. Uh, a common response is for the, for the relationships, for the relationships with the scientists and for the relationships with one another. So sometimes I give the advice to sustain the community, um, help your citizen scientists get to know one another. Uh, one of the most gratifying things in the world is when um, you know my new citizen science colleagues, um, one of them is like traveled to Japan and got together with the other one who was in Tokyo and they sent me a picture, you know, the the selfie of them together. And then it's just, uh, it, it spreads a lot of love really fast. So, um, so that's what I'd add. That, there's... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, we, I've experimented even with, um, you know, sort of artificially introducing people, um, like, um, you know, meet a citizen science colleague kind of, uh, um, I don't want to say matchmaking, but it's you know it's analogous to that, um, to to try to encourage some of these connections, and it's it's worked. <laughs> that is amazing. I think that those connections between people, as also Ryan was saying in the chat, is so integral to sustaining communities more broadly. But there are so many things that I furiously scribbling notes. Um, like, to gen like genuinely engaging with communities that you're working with, operating in low bandwidth environments, um, you know, being available at different times and actually making sure that folks are able to get involved in the way that they can, meeting, really meeting people where they are. Um, I think one thing that I'll add from the Turing Wave side of things is really how we've seen how much these the role of community calls plays in bringing together folks from across these really different parts of the project into these kind of shared rituals almost um, that happen on a weekly basis or biannual basis and having that regularity in those spaces open that sometimes it can be a little chaotic right because that's what happens when you bridge across difference but ultimately those are the spaces that allow for people to to bridge across their experiences. But that being said, I will flag here that a really interesting question that's come up in sustaining, um, for example, an open source community like the Turing Wave has been, you know, as efforts have 
have really risen and support institutional support from the Turing have arisen in order to pay people to get involved in open source, which is a huge privilege in and of itself. It does change the cadence at which people are able to work with and around a project, which means that how do you operate when, you know, when you were asking that question earlier about, you know, how do you meet people where they are? How do you meet people at the speeds and mode and amount of engagement that they actually can? Um, how do you uh, work across those different speeds? I think as, as James said at the very beginning, I think is such an integral question as we almost arrive into another phase of, you know, what does sustaining open communities look like? And, Therefore, what does sustaining a citizen science community look like? So with that in, mo in mind, I kind of maybe wanted to expand maybe a little bit outwards um, with you all to ask, you know, how is being involved as a participant, as an organizer, as a founder, as a facilitator of citizen science communities change the way that you think about science more broadly? Um, it's a big question. Um, maybe bring you back to the beginning of your story. Um, and maybe to get us started, I'll pass it on to Penn first. Right. So, so I missed like the last thirty seconds. I broke up a little bit. Can you repeat that last like that sentence? Speaking of bandwidth, right across uh, across <laughs> yes. the sea and over to Panama, um, how is how is being involved or running a citizen science project changed? your and reflect it made you reflect on your role um as a scientist more broadly thank you thank you i could hear that much <laughs> this time um i i think i've definitely experienced a big change in um and it's funny i was just having a conversation about this with another uh, a scientist yesterday and we were experiencing something similar so uh, i can use my uh, time with the memo web project i guess as an example so as I was kind of in planning earlier, when I first started it, I thought, I was thinking, you know, I have training in doing ecology and conservation field research as uh, a scientist. And uh, another thing I've been doing for many years is science outreach and communication. So when I started Web in 2014, I was like, you know, oh, this sounds like a good opportunity for me to combine these two things where I can use my science outreach abilities to, you know, attract lots of uh, volunteers to collect data and do data classification for me. Now, I personally now think of this as kind of like the crowdsourcing form of citizen science. And I have been very lucky because it did work out really well for us. So like I said, you know, there are more than 2000 participants online right now. Uh, who like to classify these images and more than 350 of them who have collected millions of wildlife images that are on our web platform right now. However, I met people like Roland, who I bring up a lot, and he's gotten used to uh, putting up with me, always using him as an example. So, uh, you know, he, he didn't know about this kind of work before, but he got curious about the wildlife uh, near his village in Northeast England. So he bought a lot of his own camera traps to set up these surveys. And he discovered a population of roe deer that people uh, weren't familiar with before. And the data he collected was so good that it actually fed into the planning by the government of a local nature reserve. And this all happened completely independent from uh, Memo Web, which I started. And it really got me thinking about, you know, different conceptions of citizen science where you know, it really isn't just one, you know, so-called scientist who crowdsourced data collection. It's also about uh, mm -hmm. a, a citizen science as a form of citizenship, where, you know, citizens like you and I actually use science as a way of civic engagement and participation. And through this, I got to know a lot of grassroots communities uh, around the world, uh, famously, like, you know, Public Lab or the Safe Cast Project in Japan, which have grown into international networks of community scientists who started, um, in this case, environmental monitoring using scientific methods, completely independent of, uh, you know, traditional scientific institutions like universities and research centers. And what's interesting about this is that a lot of this work, right, started 
you know, not by people who are like, you know, oh, we want to become citizen scientists. Like they weren't even using these concepts and terminology. They're just like, you know, hey, there's a problem we want to deal with. And let's use some uh, things in our scientific toolbox that we can come up with to answer those questions and deal with these problems. Yet, you know, on the other side of things, there are these academics. They're like, you know, oh, interesting. Uh, there are citizen scientists who are doing things, you know, in this kind of grassroots way. Let's call, call that, you know, co-created co uh, citizen science and kind of put a label on that. And there's actually an interesting tension between these things that I think is really interesting. And it really makes me reflect on the hierarchy and power dynamics uh, that are happening here. So rather, you know, than uh, academics putting a name on, you know, on, you know, things they think other people are doing, um, I, I think we really need to think about, you know, citizen science, not just as a way of, uh, uh, not just as a one way thing of crowdsourcing, but also as a possible way of collaboration and, and also um, as academics learning from people who have done things in other ways. Uh, because for example, these projects I mentioned, they've been doing open science and sharing research amongst each other long before you know, academic scientists have you know, put the name open science uh, on open science. So, so it's really, really challenged my preconceived notions and I would encourage people, you know, to be sensitive to some of these discussions. Hey, there's so much that I personally am imbibed with there, uh, especially because actually to maybe cite something that happened to me uh, last week, I loved what you said about, you know, breaking down that notion of crowdsourcing that's so often associated with citizen science, but it's really just, you know, one small sliver, if not, um, if anything, we've evolved in many ways from that um, way of talking about and with um, citizen science. Um, I was in a workshop, really interesting um, and powerful workshop last week on the use of health data in different contexts. And we'd ask two um, participants of this workshop two questions, you know, who is harmed um, uh, by the use of X amount of data or the use of the lack of equity in the use of data. And the other being, you know, who has the power to affect change or who should it be involved in the process? And actually those two questions brought about different answers um, where the people harmed were not necessarily the people being written about as the ones that should be involved in the process. And as I spoke to you all over the course of the past couple of weeks, I've really <coughs> been beginning to see citizen science as this vehicle to be able to, you know, break down the gap between who should be involved and who's most effective, anything who's harmed or talked about. Um, but that I'm going to pass to Bastian. Um, would really be really curious about how you think through these questions um, with Transbiome, with Open Humans, um, and as well as your your current work. Yeah, I think so. The the main thing I maybe want to push back a bit, saying that we've evolved past just crowdsourcing, because I think crowdsourcing citizen science is still the majority of citizen science. It's both in terms of how many projects there are. As as well as like how many thousands of people they engage like most citizen scientists are engaged in crowdsourcing <laughs> and as much as i like to give crowdsourcing citizen science a hard time personally like as an academic i know that the answer is it depends i think it's completely valid to do crowdsourcing citizen science in some disciplines where maybe there is no real harm to be done so i think maybe we have like mark here about like one of the earlier citizen science projects click workers like if you think about like people annotating images taken in, for science there is no policy implications in the short run there is no harm whether if it's not an inclusive project and it's a very different kind of citizen science on the issues that you encounter compared to what Penn was mentioning if it's about biodiversity conservation then all of a sudden there is like a implication or if you think of all spaces or transbiome where it's about human health like obviously there's a lot more at stake in a sense of like you can actually do harm to your participants compared to whether people play candy crush or annotate pictures in their web browsers like 
it's it's like the, the risk is a lot lower so i think and it's it's not to say that one of these types of citizen science is more valid than the other ones i think the problem really comes if you try to do a very simplistic crowdsourcing in these disciplines which like would warrant more participation more co-creation having people have like a say in what kind of citizen science is being done and how it's done so i think that one of the big problems is that citizen science and i think during one of our like prep talks, like Penn had mentioned Gwen Ottinger, the two cultures of citizen science, one citizen science that really comes from academics saying, hey, general public, we need your help because we want to collect too much data or we have too much data to actually do it all by ourselves. And the second from Ellen Irwin in the UK, actually, which is like going back to like the, the science done by citizens for citizens and doing otherwise undone science, which I think is to me the biggest benefit of doing citizen science, in particular health or policy related things, which is like collecting the data and doing the research, which otherwise would not have been done because academics are not interested. So transbiome is one of these examples where like, well, like, the, the type of surgery trans women have have been done since World War II, basically, but no one ever bothered asking like, so how is like the microbial flora? It's not a topic that arose yesterday. There has been 70 years of like someone had could have been doing the research, but it was people affected who decided to do the research themselves because academics failed them in a sense. And I think that's that's one very interesting way of like thinking of citizen science to me is like how much of it particularly around health, it's a, it's a way of self-defense. It's like it's stepping in where maybe the academic system has failed communities and patients. And I, I say this coming also from like a crowdsourcing background, the first citizen science project I started was asking people to donate their genome, but doing it on an open science platform where like the, your genome will be publicly available for everyone. It's all open source, open science, which is great, but participation again, is very limited, at least in terms of like the structural affordances, even if we say, well, the data is available for everyone. So now citizens can do cool genomics research. The reality is most citizens are not the ones doing genomics research at the end, just because the data is available. It takes a lot more effort to actually get people to do research than just saying, here's the data, you can do it. <laughs> it's so fascinating. And I think there is something really interesting about particularly like the um the grassroots kind of element of citizen and participatory science that like we were talking about with this transbiome project, people who have a lived experience noticing um, that they have things to contribute via that lived experience that professional scientists might not have noticed or might be passed by. So I can see your hand up, Mark, but I'm really interested in your perspective on this as well, particularly as someone who oversees a variety of citizen science projects. Yeah, I want to both applaud Bastion and also push back a little bit. So um, first of all, my hat is off to communities, to leaders of communities like you who are um, organizing these gra grassroots efforts. And that is, um, you know, I have tremendous respect for that. Um, I would like to suggest that there may be, there isn't necessarily a split between projects that are what we were, what people were talking about as being crowdsourcing, you know, we put a lot of data online or something like that. You have some very simple task, right? Um, led by a scientist um, and a grassroots kind of project because I have a growing list of examples from our NASA community of projects that start out as a simple task, you might say assigned by a scientist, right? You know, put out there by a scientist projects that start with that, but then evolve or pivot into something where the community is leading the project, coming up with the research questions, listed as the science team on the page, applying for proposals. Um, it's uh, been an amazing evolution, I would say, to watch that happening. And I hope you'll all keep your ear out for more examples of this, and I'm sure you'll find them. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's not a binary. There's a whole set of dynamic processes whereby as a researcher, you can hopefully empower um, people with lived experience as well. So it, you would hope that there could be some sort of mutual solidarity and support. Um, I'm really particularly interested in James's perspective of this as someone who is um, a participatory co-researcher and who's been leading on elements of citizen science. I think that 
In the space of autism research, a lot of it is a response to some of the historic failures um, where autism research has sometimes elided the voices of autistic people, spoken about autistic people rather than to autistic people, and sometimes categorize autism as dysfunction or disease um, rather than difference. And then it took people who have actually got personal lived experience to challenge some of those dominant narratives. But now there are like a growing number of autistic re autism researchers who are promoting um, community-based science and it, the autism advocacy movement has hugely changed how most researchers discuss autism as well. So there seems to be this kind of quite reciprocal learning process. So yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by your point of view on this, James. Yeah, no, thanks, Georgia. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And I think when we speak, when we've heard, we've spoken previously about the, the classical gap between academia and research and, and subjects of research, and I mean, historically, that's led to some pretty horrendous things being done to people over the years. Um, and I think that legacy still exists um, in, in um, certainly in autism research. Um, there are still some very, um, uh, very problematic and actually probably quite unscientific research that goes on in relation to, for example, an automated diagnosis um, of autism, which you, which you can still see those sort of studies in existence. So I think it makes absolute sense. It makes, it makes total sense that if you're going to actually do research into um, autism, that you have to involve members of the um, autistic community. Um, but I think that is something actually, which is a, um, a new thing to view, um, to view, you know, to move away from this medicalized version or understanding of, um, of, um, of people, which has been pre um, predominant throughout, you know, a very long period of time. Um, and we see this as well in terms of you know, um, in the workplace as well, where we're starting to move away from the medical version uh, or medical conception of, of disability. Um, but there's still a very long way to go um, and it's not going to change overnight. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But I think actually, um, you know, these sort of projects are very, very important in shifting the dial and um, really kind of also building up a far richer source of data, which um, I think would be very, very useful over the longer term um, as more Aurora is collected. Um, I think just a little bit kind of pivoting slightly as well. Um, I think it's worth thinking about some of the techniques that are utilized in um, citizen science projects and actually the potential benefits that there could be in other areas. So in my area um, of, da of data um, and data ethics, um, you know, I'm acutely aware that a lot of techniques that have been utilized in all spaces in terms of the participatory nature of the project, particularly in terms of the, the consent models for data, um, the autonomy that people have over data um, and, and, um, and the choices that they have over how that's used actually potentially could be um, become a lot more um, common and, and be utilized over I think potentially the next decade. I think there's going to, you know, I think it's possible that there will be a big push in terms of user autonomy, data autonomy, data portability. And actually a lot of the tools that we're trying here, I think could be very, very useful um, in this um, in this wider, wider question. So. Um, I think actually as well, thinking about um, the wider applications of citizen science techniques and how where they could potentially lead over the next couple of years as well is a really interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, that's everything for me. I cannot believe that we are already at the top of the hour, uh, which means that it, this marks the end of our the report, recorded part of our session um, today. Uh, we could do a rapid closing um, statement with a very, very brief uh, answer to the question of where do you see citizen science evolving towards? Um, and then we'll close out the recorded part of our session today and turn off the recording. And like I said at the beginning of this call, we'll leave it open for an additional 30 minutes or so folks can ask other questions and we can bring in some of the really interesting discussion being had in the chat. Um, so with that being said, um, where do you see citizen science evolving going forward? I think James, you brought in so many things that really, I think brought us really beautifully into that space. So maybe let's go in the opposite order. I'll pass it back to James, um, then to Mark, then to Bastian, then to Penn, and then Georgia can close us out. So I think citizen science will continue to grow. I think it will continue to, we'll continue to see a, 
um, a greater integration and, and greater involvement of um, community members uh, in projects. Um, I think certainly there will be more acceptance and credibility um, and you will, and, and, um, and a, a blur, sort of a blurring of those boundaries between classic sort of um, classic, cl classic kind of walled, uh, garden wall science and, um, and citizen science. I think as well in terms of, um, in terms of, but I, I mean, I think obviously there are challenges, um, there are going to be, um, there will always be, I think, that divide uh, to a degree. Um, and, but I think ultimately the quality of the data um, the, and the growth of the data sets will make it ignorable that actually you can do things at scale that you just cannot do in a classic, um, a classic environment. So that's my uh, slightly open to takeaway on this. Absolutely love that. I'll pass it on to you, Mark. Thanks. Um, I mean, I think part of the future of citizen science is open science. You know, I think that the more things are open and um, we can start seeing citizen science, citizen science projects as sort of becoming wrappers around open science um, resources, right? So here's the, here are the resources. Here's the cool open hardware and software and stuff grab that data, wondering what to do with it. By the way, we've got this cool like research question and community that's built and you add that to the open science, you know, infrastructure and poof, it's a citizen science community and project. Uh, that's one direction. Another direction I see it evolving is blending more, particularly the projects that are um, more along the lines of crowdsourcing, scientist-led projects, that kind of project I'm seeing, I don't wanna say, maybe it's premature to say merging or maybe it's not, but I've seen that used more and more in classrooms. So there's a big, uh, lots of students out there, right? Who would love the opportunity instead of having a homework assignment be an arbitrary sort of problem, could it also be contributing to real science? And they're okay by the fact that they've stepped into a classroom, They're they're, they're ready to re receive something that has been uh, offered to them from a teacher from an educational perspective, right? And that is a, a can be a very good combination, um, student and a scientist proposed citizen science project. Thanks. I feel like our attempt to close this session has actually made so many more questions come in the process. Um, I'll pass on to, to Bastian and then Ken. Yeah, I think that the points both that James and Mark made are, are really great. I think I, I agree that citizen science in general will keep on growing. And I think there's like an increasing support and recognition also on the policy funding level of like the importance of citizen science. So like the, the European Commission, like European wide, like fosters now, like if you try to apply for a grant with them for getting lots of money from them, like that you somehow should be doing citizen science or at least consider it. I think maybe a bit less optimistic. I think there's a, at least a bit of a risk that this leads to it being very easily co-opted because now it's like a checkbox people need to take in order to get money, which can be quite problematic. I think we've seen this also at the European <coughs> Commission level, at least for science outreach and engagement, which is like more like a one way how to communicate to the public and like a whole cottage industry has sprung up about like, well, pay someone to like write this journalistic looking article so you can say in your grant report you did outreach on some level and no one will ever actually read it. And I'm a bit afraid that this is this kind of citizen science that will come out of like this push for like funders and policymakers saying you now need to make citizen science. The researchers who have no interest or expertise in doing citizen science are forced to do it. It's maybe not the kind of citizen science everyone here on the call would like to see. So I think there we need to be a bit uh, vigilant about what will happen in the near future in terms of growing citizen science to avoid that we fall into this trap. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Definitely. Pass on the pen. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> this, it's going to be really hard to try to you know, 
pride yourself and I, I I feel really pressured being the last person, uh, but I'll do my best. So uh, I guess I'll just quickly um, end by saying two things. Uh, one is that um, going forward, I think, you know, we can and should be more mindful of the fact that what we can consider as citizen science, um, uh, uh, again, you know, Yes, there is a lot of cross-dressing going on, and that's actually great. Like, I don't think we need to stop a lot of extreme forms of it, but let's just be very mindful that there are actually other traditions out there that have been going on for much longer than even this term has existed, uh, where a, a lot of people around the world have been doing science in different ways, right? And and it's great to acknowledge and embrace that so that um, uh, as a lot of academics are here today or people who work in institutions, you know, um, uh, it really isn't, you know, just a one-way street, which leads me to my second and last point. And it's that, you know, if I were talking to myself uh, about this uh, six or seven years ago, I would encourage myself to remember that uh, I should think of citizen science, you know, as a form of collaboration, right? Because, you know, coming from a scientific background, you know, I work with other, you know, so-called scientists because we each bring something different to the table. And in a citizen science context, it's also very much a collaboration where, yes, I might be bringing some professional expertise to the table, but I am working with a lot of other people who are bringing diverse uh, sets of experiences and skills that I do not have into this collaboration to work with me. And I am learning a lot from them throughout this process as well. And, you know, when studying citizen science, I think that's something so important to keep in mind. Absolutely. What a wonderful way to close us off. I'll pass it on to, to Georgia to end the session today. And those are all such fantastic, thoughtful responses to that question. And I, I want to kind of respond to everyone and carry on the conversation much longer. Um, but I think from my point of view, there, there is this kind of interesting sense following on from you, what you were saying, Penn, about um, citizen science um, is, is a kind of formalized modern version of something which is much older than even the role of the scientist itself. Science is older than scientific institutions. Um, so in some sense, it's quite a fundamental part of the evolution of science. Um, and science as a profession is much more recent. Um, I think that in terms of where I see citizen science going, I think that it's not at all certain. I can agree with Bastian that some kind of vigilance is required. Um, but also with James and Mark, there's a huge amount of possibility. We can see this set of citizen science has kind of proven itself in terms of people, um, the power of people en masse contributing to science can have some really amazing results. Um, and that's been quite demonstrated and led to a lot of excitement. And also I think that science as a whole is having to change in response to the reproducibility crisis and a sense that we need to actually be much more investigative of our own um, structures of scientific discovery, the kind of production and dissemination of science not being a neutral process, but being one which is um, prone to certain kinds of bias and certain kinds of um, discrepancy in, when it comes to power and when it comes to participation. Uh, so that I think is something that science is, is kind of evolving into a, a place of being much less focused on a single um, role of a scientist who is kind of at some remove from um, other professional roles. There's a whole kind of ecosystem that scientists are embedded in. Um, but I think as well, uh, in terms of vigilance, we have to be really careful. I think the thing that I think is more precarious is the participatory aspect which is privileging lived experience, which is distributing power. And if we are, well, certainly in the UK, I think in times of austerity or cuts or um, resistance to sort of collaborative social 
distributive mechanisms or we are looking at, for instance, um, sort of competitive narratives of science focused on prestige, which is a kind of can be sometimes a zero sum thing, uh, then that I think runs counter to the kind of collaborative shared um, spirit that I think is probably like the best version of citizen science from my point of view. So yeah, I can see, I can see it dividing, I can see it going in a positive direction, <laughs> being stripped of some of its funding and resource and declining in certain respects. So I think we're really at a, a, a transitional point. What a beautiful way to end today. Um, and I think with that, I just want to uh, thank you all for joining us, uh, to James, to Bastian, to Mark, to Penn, and to Georgia for co-organizing. I will, with this, turn off the video um, and unpin all of our videos. Thank you so much uh, for sticking with us. I know we're a little bit past the hour. There's just so, so much to say on this topic. And I think in asking the question of, you know, where do we see citizen science going? We actually ask more broadly, where do we see science and research itself progressing into the future? Um, and of course, embedded within our wider social context. So with that, thanks again so much. And I'll turn off the video.